Howdy team, this episode will focus on the references. This episode will go on as follows. First we'll look at why the use of references is vital and quality report. Then we'll look at two different quality of examples. We'll just uh, look at the common mistakes and the kind of good practice they adopt. And we'll finish off the episode with some further resources to help you use references throughout your work. So why are references important? Well, without references, it's just you spouting nonsense. It's like reading a news article with unsubstantiated claims. It means bugger all. Similar kind of sports rumours on Twitter. You need to back up the points you're making, the results you're comparing, and the literature you're citing to add some weight. Together, these will add authority to your report. It's paramount that your report showcases this authority throughout, or else it can start to resemble an amateurish operation. Along the same line, the reference quality also matters. Just because at Coatbridge Boy, whose dad is a janitor in Celtic Park, says Celtic will sound messy, doesn't mean it's going to happen. However, this quality aspect of references is covered in research writing quickies series rather than this series. Today we're just going to be focusing on how to use references in text. Future episodes, mainly the Microsoft Word episode, will focus on the actual references section and putting that into uh, a document. So here's a marking rubric for the references section. There's only two criteria, uh, and it's formatting and discrimination. We'll touch on both of these aspects. However, the research writing quickies, as I said, will also be necessary if you need to get up to scratch with what does it mean by discrimination. So here's our poor example. From this small paragraph, there are three points I want to bring up. Make sure you have a read of this first before we get into it. In the first point, the context for this reference is rather verbose. Unless you're making a point about Leeds Beckett, there's no need to kind of refer to the actual university. So unless you're actually using Leeds Beckett again, maybe you're using it in a table to kind of compare, but then you just usually give the reference rather than say Leeds Beckett. So you don't need to say that X and Y wrote this from whatever university they're from. You just need to say, in a series of publications, process to create randomised VMs was introduced. In the second point, we can see the use of multiple references grouped together. This is excellent, especially as a sentence starts with in a series of publications. I'd be expecting multiple. Also, this has been done in chronological order. This only really makes sense because of it's a series of publications. When you're doing multiple, and it might be multiple from different people, really it just doesn't really matter if it's chronological or not. Tied to that point, the plurality isn't carried over to the second sentence, so you can see how it's almost been written in isolation. The first sentence starts with a series of publications, but yet the second sentence starts with the aim of this research, or the aim of the, the, aim of the research. You can either change this to the aim of this research, or this avenue of research, just to make sure that you are keeping consistent. When you're using references, it can get quite confusing to the reader to know what's going on. Overall, this would receive an okay mark. It wouldn't be great, but it wouldn't be bad either. They've at least done what's proper. So here's our decent example. The term virtual machine was first used in Nelson, 1964. So you may think, whoa, hold on. You're contextualising this again. You just gave us off of that for the poor one. But how come this is green? Well, this time we've used the author's surname has been used. This only had one author. When you actually mention the author by name, then that's when you can just give the year in which it was published in brackets. This has been done to great effect here as it keeps the language concise and it keeps the story going. This is just the kind of nuance you pick up when you keep on writing. The reason why it's better to use Nelson here rather than having it at the end is because this is quite a long sentence and what we want to say is when it was first used. So if we say the term of the virtual machine was first used in 1964, you're really not giving honest to the person who done it. This is much more of a polite way and a more rigorous way to write for this reference. The second reference raises suspicion. Unless this specific paper provides a history of virtual machines or provides an updated definition which other research widely cite, it is redundant. 
although there might be a need for this reference, I'm a little bit, mm, I don't really know if this is going to be correct or not. So don't just try and chuck them in willy-nilly. There has to be a rhyme or reason why they're there. Here are some further reading resources for references. While they'll not be the most page-turning of reading, these resources will be extremely beneficial when securing a good grade. Especially at Aberté, you want to look at the top one, which shows you how to actually reference in the Harvard style we expect at Aberté. A long phrase bank has some ways in which you can introduce references using similar methods to Nelson and not using things like the Leeds Beckett example earlier. So, in summary, this reporting quickie episode has looked at references. We've spoken about how references add authority. This authority is required in a report to make it look like you know what you're talking about. Through our exemplars, we've seen some techniques I hope to see when marking, and some mistakes I hope to not see replicated in your reports. And finally, we've some from further resources which you should check out to learn more about referencing. That's been all from me. Hope you've enjoyed this episode, and good luck.